Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. A lot of the works haven't been seen in many years. He had 21 million black folks riding on what's going to happen. The last eight years have been like the best eight years of my life. Today on Spotlight, how a cookbook turned into a story of relationships and overcoming racial biases. Plus, a local biotech company hopes to revolutionize cancer immunotherapy treatments. And then a documentary on baseball segregation and how Jackie Robinson broke barriers. But our first two stories take you to the new exhibits currently on display at the St. Louis Art Museum. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. We're here at the St. Louis Art Museum and we have opened an exhibition that really is the result of 15 years of research and it concerns a practice that started in Rome in the 16th century where artists use pieces of stone as painting supports. And when we say a support, we mean the surface on which they painted. So before that, they had primarily used panel. Um, canvas was coming into use, but starting in the 1530s, a rather enterprising artist in Rome developed a method for making paint stick reliably to stone. So at the beginning, artists covered the stone completely because the stone had meaning. It wasn't about a visual property. But starting in the later part of the 16th century, artists began to integrate the visual qualities of the stone into the paintings they were making. A piece of lapis lazuli that is a blue stone they would use for sky or to make a rich blue robe. They also had types of stones that had various lines in them and they could make those the lines of water or they could make them landscapes or they could make them trees or tree branches. So it became a visual thing to integrate the natural formations and colorations on the stone into the final painted work. I really knew nothing about this until we bought a painting at auction in 2000. This was something suggested to us by a beloved museum patron, and it's a small oval painting on lapis lazuli, one of the richest and most beautiful of the stones that's used. In researching it is when I learned about this practice that started in the 1530s and went through really the 18th century, and it resulted in the exhibition that viewers will see today. So not only did this particular artist named Cavalieri d'Arpino paint on lapis lazuli, but he painted it on several other stones, also on copper, on canvas, and panel. And we were able to bring all those together so people can really get a sense of what's the difference. Why would an artist think of how visually a painting would be affected by putting it on stone versus putting it on canvas, panel, or copper? So they're all in the exhibition to be seen. There have been a few exhibitions in the past that featured private collections that had more pieces in them, but they didn't represent as many artists or as many types of stones. So in that way, this is really the fullest and most comprehensive survey of the practice of painting on stone surfaces. When people come to the exhibition, they'll notice that there are a number of works that are in plexiglass wall cases. So they allows them to get actually closer to them than they could normally, so they can appreciate the detail. And they can also appreciate what is stone and what is painting. The artists that will be encountered in this exhibition really respond very differently to using stone. So there's a wide variety of responses to using stone and a wide variety of ways in which the artists integrate the stone into the work of art. The exhibition is on view through May 15th, and for further information about ticketing or other things, people should go to slam.org. Also on display at the St. Louis Art Museum, Impressionism and Beyond. This is Impressionism and Beyond, an exhibition in the Prints, Drawings, and Photographs galleries at the St. Louis Art Museum. It's an exhibition that focuses on prints and drawings from Western Europe um, from a period of about 1850 into the 1930s. Impressionism is a movement that focuses on 
light and color. So a lot of the works have very vibrant colors. They have this kind of incredible sense of light to them. But the exhibition looks at kind of different parts of Impressionism and the works that are occurring at the same time. So there's a really wide variety of objects on view in this exhibition. It features a lot of very famous artists like Edgar Degas, Edvard Munch, Pablo Picasso, Henri Matisse, and Vincent van Gogh. And we have some really incredible works by these artists too, especially the pastel by Degas of his ballet dancers in the wings. It's really one of the jewels of our collection and it's something that's not on view very often. So this is a really great opportunity for people to come see that. At the same time, there are a lot of artists who were working concurrently with the Impressionists, but are maybe not as well known by people. Um, artists like Odion Redon, who was a symbolist artist who was working at the same time as Degas and Monet and some of the other Impressionist artists. He actually exhibited with the Impressionists, but he's working in a very different style. He's focusing exclusively on images made in black and makes these kind of incredibly fantastical images that are very different from, say, Degas' dancers. This period is also a particularly rich time for the generation of prints and drawings. So we wanted to explore how artists were using these mediums in kind of innovative and new ways. A lot of the works on view in this exhibition come from our collection because this is an area of real strength for us. Um, but we're also really excited to be able to show a group of loans from local collections. And the loans really allow us to fill in some gaps and tell a more complete story about the art from this period. The works on view in this exhibition are primarily works on paper, and these are notoriously fragile and light sensitive. So a lot of the works that are on view haven't been seen in many years. A lot of them won't be seen again for many years after this. So this is a really incredible opportunity for people to come in and see objects that they may never have gotten a chance to see before. Impressionism and Beyond is on view through July 31st, 2022. And if you have any questions or need more information, you can visit slam.org. It's the podcast for parents, teachers, and anyone interested in the education system. Classroom Matters, hosted by Educate.Today's Christy Hool. Find Classroom Matters on Educate.Today or wherever you get your podcasts. You guys are go-getters. Yeah. Yeah. They are stupid. I just don't sleep for all of them. Dumb. I think we're a little dits. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Mishama Bailey and John Morisano, New Yorkers who moved to Savannah, Georgia to start the award-winning restaurant The Gray in 2014. I want to blanch them before we grill them so we can get the right amount of char on them. Before The Gray, John was an entrepreneur in the media startup world. Mishama, a social worker turned personal chef, turned sous chef in New York City. But as executive chef at The Gray in 2019, Mishama won the prestigious James Beard Award for Best Chef in the Southeast and was featured on Netflix's Chef's Table. Since then, the two have opened another restaurant in Savannah, are working on opening two more in Austin, Texas, and recently released Black, White, and The Gray. See? Go-getters. It's really rewarding, you know, and and I, I feel like I've grown so much. Like, Jono's always been like, Jono's very open. You know, Jono likes rom coms and he's very open about <laughs> So what? Like, why do you why do you gotta do that to me? He's very open about his feelings and you know how much he loves and appreciates our partnership. And you know, and I think I feel I feel like honestly, like the last eight years have been like the best eight years of my life. As for the book, it started out as an agent's idea for Mashama to write a cookbook. I really wanted Jono to get this guy off my back. He <laughs> followed me around this festival for three days. And every time I looked up, he was there talking about a cookbook and talking about us being in business together. While the final version does have recipes at the end of each chapter, Jono originally convinced the agent he would write a book on entrepreneurship and his idea to open a restaurant in a formerly segregated bus terminal in Savannah, even though he had zero restaurant experience. Eventually, Mashama agreed to add her antidotes. They would be handwritten in the margins. 
can I just say this? We literally marginalized the black woman. Yeah. So it's like, I never felt great about that concept, but I said, okay, let's see what it looks like. And I remember telling a friend of mine about it where I took a, I went away, wrote, did some writing, came back and on my way back to Spain, I was like, so listen, and this is the concept and I'm going to be in the margins. And as soon as I said it, it was just like, yeah, that's not a good thing. The two realized they had a lot more to discuss and say. They rented a flat in Paris for six weeks to concentrate on writing during the day. At night, they ate out to work on expanding the Grey's menu. In the end, they wrote a book about the challenges of starting a restaurant, but also about their relationship as a white male and a black female in business together in the South. That's when it became a book about race, class, and culture. It was really nice being business partners and having our own um, positions or our own jobs in the restaurant. But when we really started talking about the things that motivated us and the things that scarred us in the past or, or what are the things that are going to propel us to be closer or better owners, um, we never really talked about things like race or class this book really brought a lot of that stuff to light. I think every day I try to figure out like how can I be more affluent in what I do in order to inspire people like me to do what I do. Find out about the tough lessons they've learned along the way. Watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. A unique way the stadium preps for opening day later on Spotlight. Our goal is to cut cancer death rates by at least 50% over the next 25 years. I think we can do better than that. Turn cancers from death sentences into treatable diseases. More support for patients and their families to drive breakthroughs in cancer, Alzheimer's and diabetes, and more. A unity agenda for the nation. The influx of federal dollars from President Biden's cancer moonshot should help St. Louis area companies in the cancer research space. One such company is Immunophotonics, a St. Louis biotech company dedicated to developing its cancer immunotherapy technology for the benefit of global human health. Lou Alaruzzo is doing something different. It involves a novel technology in the field of interventional immuno-oncology. Interventional immuno-oncology in its simplest form is the convergence of tumor destruction with immune stimulation to attack the cancer. And we're spearheading this new field through the development of our lead asset, IP001. IP001 is the name for a one-of-a-kind immune-stimulating drug developed by the St. Louis-based biotechnology company Immunophotonics. The company launched in the Biogenerator Lab in the BioSTL building in St. Louis. CEO and co-founder El Aruzzo is helping his company make groundbreaking progress with a promising cancer treatment. First, IP001 is designed to be coupled with common methods for tumor ablation. With tumor ablation, you're leaving behind the dead tumor tissue. And typically that's cleared through standard physiological processes. And what's interesting is that tumor debris contains information about the cancer. To retrieve that information, Alaruzzo says the company's new technology first successfully infiltrates what remains of the enemy after the ablation procedure. Tumor fragments, such as particular tumor antigens. And tumor antigens are the distinguishing element between cancer and self. So if you can utilize that tumor antigen and say, this is what the enemy looks like, we can use that information to train the immune system on what they need to seek out and destroy wherever it is in the body. In a way, the drug is designed to investigate, kind of like a spy. That then captures what the enemy looks like. So it has a specific charge profile along its, the backbone of this very large molecule. And that allows it to intertwine, interact with biological material and physically pull it and retain it on site. We hold it in a location and we slowly hand out that information as immune cells come and say, hey, I'd like to see what you're holding. The mission in this battle begins when the therapy is injected immediately following the ablation. It's the beginning of what would become the body's ability to wage war on cancer. And then the immune system recruits its army, the killer T cells. 
and it sends that army out not only to the ablated or destroyed tumor tissue, but also distant, untreated tumors that might also be in the body. And that's the innovation of IP001. We're now to the point where we've transitioned into early clinical studies that were led by investigators. We've completed our phase one B trial. And in general, um, while I can't discuss all of the details, I can say the physicians are excited. I can say there are signals that our team's excited about. And he's excited about how he believes it will advance cancer treatments for many kinds of cancer. And that's not all. Some promising results that indicate applicability in infectious disease applications. For more information, go to our website, hecmedia.org. The documentary, The Color of Change, recounts the history of baseball segregation through firsthand experience and looks at the significant contributions that African-American players have made to the major leagues. So the question is, how could baseball bill itself as America's pastime when it wouldn't even allow black and white ball players to play on the same field? Well, perhaps the answer is that it was America's pastime in spite of itself, because the game would eventually provide us with that bridge that would help solve America's greatest social ill. Now, to take us on this long and difficult journey, we needed to find someone who had lived through it all, both the good and the bad, the hate and the love. And no one fits that description better than baseball's ultimate poet laureate, the ageless Buck O'Neill. Now, Buck is a son of the South. He's a former Negro League player and a manager. He's a barnstorming teammate of Satchel Paige and Cool Papa Bell and was a manager of the legendary Kansas City Monarchs. And ultimately, he became a major league pioneer as its first black coach and scout. 1920 was the formation of the Negro Leagues by a former player, Rube Foster. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Rube and why he was such a smart businessman. Rube was a Hall of Fame pitcher, but had that great mind and he, he, he thought if he organized, because the black ball players, they were playing, you know, they've been playing since the Civil War. He thought if he organized the black ball players, National League would take a black team and the American League would take a black team. That was his thinking in 1920. And it doesn't happen until, you know, integrated until 47. Now, there was another great owner in, in the, in the uh, Negro Leagues, and that was uh, J.L. Wilkinson. J.L. Wilkinson owned the Kansas City Monarchs. He was the only white owner in the Negro Leagues. And J.L. Wilkinson, or innovator, J.L. Wilkinson actually came out with the lights. See, we had lights in the Negro Leagues five years before you had lights at Cincinnati. We would play like... A Sunday, a Saturday night ball game, a Sunday ball game, we'd fill up the ballpark. But you're playing day ball, and uh, you, you people working. But he put those lights out. Now we're playing at night, the people off. We filling up the ballpark. A lot of people just come in to see the lights. You know, as good a businessman as Rube Foster was, you have to wonder if even he understood the level of talent that he was assembling back then. Batting averages in excess of the high 300s, well, they weren't that uncommon. And with the advent of the radar gun in 1935, Negro League pitchers were being clocked at speeds equal to, and in some cases, in excess of the top pitchers in today's ball game. Some of the people that you played with, Josh Gibson. Outstanding hitter, one of the greatest hitters that ever lived. Now, I tell you what. Sosa McGuire, great power hitters, but they weren't great hitters. Now, Babe Ruth, Josh Gibson, not only great power hitters, great hitters, maybe 350 or better, lifetime batting average. These was the guy, and, and that Josh Gibson could wear the ball out. I tell you, an incident, we playing in, in D.C. and uh, playing the World Series in 1942. We leading in the ninth inning, they got a kid on first base. This is a, this was a young guy playing second base for the Grays named Carlisle. He was on first base. We get two outs, and Josh comes to the bat. And this kid tried to steal second base. We get him out. The game was over. And Josh said, 
son, what were you thinking about trying to steal second base? He said, Josh, I was trying to get in scoring position. He said, son, I'm in scoring position when I come to the plate. <laughs> <laughs> Now let's go to another guy, Satchel Page. Had it all, had it all. The best control I'd ever seen. Fastball, they, they clocked him in Washington throwing the fastball 100 miles an hour. He called me Nancy, he said, Nancy, I didn't know they were clocking me. I could have thrown harder than that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ricky. Mr. Ricky, I'm certainly pleased with the contract, and that last little bit you says, I hope to do it as well as last year, get a better contract. Thank you very much. As history would prove, Robinson taking the field as a major leaguer would not only erase the color barriers in baseball, but it marked the shifting tide against racism in America. One question still remains. With so many tremendous athletes in the Negro Leagues, what made Branch Ricky choose Jackie Robinson? Jackie. Wasn't the best ball player we had, but Jackie was the right ball player. I mean, it was right from the standpoint he had the right temperament because there were probably people who probably did not have the patience of a Jackie Robinson to endure the things that he had to endure. Now, I can see perhaps why they took Jackie Robinson into the, to the leagues. It wasn't so much so that he was a more outstanding baseball player than some of the other people there, but he was more business-minded. Jackie was a college graduate. He was educated, I put it like that. You take the ball players in my day coming up, some of them didn't have a fifth grade education. Jackie understood that he had 21 million black folks riding on what's gonna happen. You understand? This is Jackie Robinson. Like I knew Willie Wells, I knew guys that were better than Jack at the time, but the sucker had thrown a black cat on that field with Willie Wells. Willie Wells had picked that cat up, walked in the stands and shoved it down the sucker's throat. <laughs> and that would have been the end of it. And then they'd say, I told you so. But Jackie knew, and Jackie knew, and I do believe, and I always will believe, Jackie died young because of what he had to go through. You know, that what he couldn't fight back. And Jackie was a fighter. Jackie would knock you on your rump. Jackie was a fighter all the way. But he understood what he had to do. That was Jackie Robinson, man. The Negro Leagues turned off their lights forever in the early 1960s. But in 1962, Jackie Robinson found his place in Cooperstown. And that same year, Buck O'Neill became the first African-American coach in the major leagues embarking on a legendary 32-year career with the Chicago Cubs. Buck O'Neill passed away on October 6, 2006 at the age of 94. As one of baseball's greatest ambassadors and storytellers, O'Neill will at last be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame Class of 2022. To watch the full documentary, The Color of Change, visit hecmedia.org. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place. HECmedia.org. Gussie Bush was truly the king of beers. And although he passed away 30 years ago, the Cardinals are still polishing his image. I like him to look good for the opening day. Don Wiegand is a sculptor based in Chesterfield. And in 1982, he was hired by St. Louis University to create a life-sized bust of August A. Bush Jr., the larger-than-life beer baron who also owned the Cardinals. It's a great honor. I mean, I love Mr. Bush. I love the city. He was a great man. The Cardinals liked the sculpture so much. In 1989, the team commissioned Wiegand to create this larger version for Bush Stadium. I had it bolted to the floor so hard at the, at the previous stadium. Uh, anytime a truck drove by, Gussie's head started bobbing. So the way we actually had to fix it was uh, we had to put four hockey pucks 
and put those underneath as, as uh, bumpers, and that absorbed the shock so his head didn't bob anymore. And while that was a one-time fix, Wiegand and a team of volunteers come back every year on the day before opening day to give Mr. Bush a makeover, giving special attention to the parts meant to be extra shiny. Carbon monoxide and all the cars driving and the uh, pollution hurts bronze. It changes the color. It'll naturally turn green. But the tricks I do with most of my pieces, I do highlights which uh, complement parts like, for instance, the cane, the collar. It makes it a little more contemporary, but it gives it a little more pizzazz. Wiegand was told by Gussie's secretary he should expect Mr. Bush would only pose for the sculpture one time. Boy, was she wrong. Over two years, he came out over 21 times. He sat there for usually an hour, an hour and a half. We'd drink some beer, we'd hang out. It was great. Wiegand's team of volunteers bring back Gussie's luster using a combination of special compounds and everyday products. They even wax it with shoe polish. I asked Mr. Bush, what symbolizes your life that I can incorporate into this piece? He said the Rams King, the Legion of Merit pin, the Anheuser pin, and of course the ring. And I said, Mr. Bush, do you want your Cardinals ring or do you want your wedding ring? He said, I want the wedding ring, Don. I said, smart man. <laughs> the Anheuser pin, that was Gussie's grandfather's. And I, I always like to let the family members come in and put the sparkle back on that. And one of the Bush family regulars is Blake Valentine. Gussie Bush's grandson. He was only four years old when Gussie died. So the statue, in a way, has become a stand-in for the grandfather he barely knew. I've been doing it for the last six years. Every time I see this statue, I think of him, and it's so great to see him every, for every game. And I always rub his hands for good luck. Most visitors to Bush Stadium probably walk right past Mr. Bush without giving him a second thought. After all, he died in 1989. But Don Wiegand knows a bright, shiny object will draw some people's attention, which is why he keeps coming back every spring to gussy up gussy. I think it's important that we do continue the heritage of teaching what do these people do to encourage those folks those young folks to think, believe in yourself and you can do it, but you have to do something. We need to commemorate people like this. Next week, accomplished prolific painter, Wallace Herndon Smith. Plus, the St. Louis Zoo teams up with other zoos to fight climate change. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.